Okay, we still have people joining, but I think we will go ahead and get started at this point. I wanted to say welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we are really excited for the topic today. Today's webinar discussion is a comprehensive overview of CMMC requirements. I'm Jacqueline von Ogden. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications here at SimCorp. Today we're going to be, we are going to be covering the why, the how, and the when for CMMC requirements. We're going to spend about 30 minutes with our speaker on this topic, and then we will open it up for a Q&A. And today's speaker is Jeff Dalton. Jeff Dalton is the Vice Chair of the CMMC accreditation body and chair of the credentialing and accreditation committee. In that role, he has led the development of the CMMC ecosystem, including the programs for C3PAOs, registered provider organizations, registered practitioners, and provisional assessors. Jeff is a career technologist that has held leadership positions with Ernst & Young, Hewlett Packard, General Motors, and IntelliCorp before starting his own firm in 2005. He's the former board and chair of the CMMI Institute Partner Advisory Board, is on the board at Agile CXO, and joined the CMMC AB Board of Directors in January of 2020. So I'd like to say a, a huge welcome to Jeff for uh, joining us in this discussion today. Um, we, like I said, we are going to go ahead and have about 30 minutes of a presentation and then we will follow it up with a QA. and a uh, Many of you emailed questions in prior to this webinar, so thank you for that. We will cover those questions and of course you can feel free to ask any questions uh, as the uh, presentation concludes. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Jeff. Thank you very much, Jackie, and uh, it's super exciting to be here. It's honored to be here, really. I've uh, done quite a few webinars and presentations this year, as you might imagine, and um, every one of them is different. So it's, it's really fascinating to see what people are interested in and to hear from the people that are going to be either uh, adopting CMMC or um, using it in their business uh, as C3PAOs and RPOs and other types of service provider organization. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, why CMM, CMMC, I apologize, I may, I may slip that acronym up a couple of times, um, why CMMC is so important and, and why the DOD decided to go down the path they went down. And then we'll talk a little bit about the ecosystem and the roles and, you know, when some things are coming out. Um, and then just kind of uh, wrap up with just an overview of, of some of the things that are going to be happening next. And then from there, we're, I'm happy to take whatever questions. So I'm going to talk to you about for about 25 minutes or so and um, just show you a few things. And then I'm happy to take questions about the ecosystem, about the timing, about you know really anything you all want to talk about. So I'm happy to keep it as interactive as possible. Um, so I know probably a lot of your uh, attendees know what CMMC is, but for those of you that may not, and, and maybe some of those maybe need some clarification, um, CMMC, uh, well, there, there's a number of components within the CMMC ecosystem and the model itself, the CMMC model, um, is a maturity model. And that's very different than say an audit model like ISO 27001 or 20,000 or NIST 800-171, which are, you know, yes, no models that, that have, um, you know, major deficiencies or, or POAMs as they call them in NIST. Um, and, you know, they have time to work on them. And the maturity model offers a very different view of, of how we move forward. It's an evolutionary path to improving the performance of your cyber posture. And this is important because, you know, it's very difficult for an organization to all of a sudden meet all 110 practices in this data 171, um, especially when they're smaller companies. And it made sense to have a level one that was people just starting out or maybe contractors that don't handle controlled and classified information, um, you know, uh, tool and die shops, screw manufacturers, uh, assembly shops, things like that, that, you know, maybe some IT shops, things that aren't handling classified or controlled unclassified information, and um, maybe don't need to be level three, four or five and, and get to that level of, of high performance. So uh, the CMMC is, is much needed in the industry because of that, because it offers that evolutionary path. So companies can start at level one and then move up to level two, perhaps, and then to level three over a period of time. And it also gives the Department of Defense and 
I would expect other agencies in the future, a tool to uh, assign levels to various levels of a contract. So a prime, for instance, may be required to be level three or four. Um, some of the subs may be required to be levels one or two. And it gives them a tool to kind of set the expectation of this is how we expect you to be managing your cyber posture um, when you're working on this contract. So it's very different than an audit model. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a very good change to the way we've been doing business. But there's also other parts of that ecosystem. There's the uh, assessment methodology. This is an independent assessor that comes to your location with an assessment team and provides a, an assessment of compliance with CMMC. Um, that's built into the ecosystem also. Um, training is built into the ecosystem, consulting and advice services. So there's a lot of different components. It isn't just the model itself. And for the last year, I've been lucky enough to work with, you know, what I think are some of the smartest people on the planet um, to, uh, to put this program together. Uh, 12, you know, very, very capable volunteers that, that have worked as a team for a year now to put this entire ecosystem together and it is ready to go. So we're just about ready to start assessments anytime now. Uh, and speaking of that, um, the DOD has targeted um, 10 contracts and I, sometimes I hear 15, so I'm not 100% sure what the number is at the moment, but um, they've targeted some contracts, mostly out of uh, the military, the Navy and, and others, um, where they're going to pilot CMFC assessments. Now. You may think 10 contracts is small, but it's about 1500 companies. And so the plan for 2021 is to prioritize these 12 to 1500 companies and do whatever other commercially available assessments can be done in that time frame to kind of pilot and try out the assessment method and the training and the certifications and the tools and everything that's been developed over the last year. Uh, but within five years, all DOD contracts will have some degree of CMFC requirement, depending on uh, mostly, uh, well, there's a couple of different factors, but mostly if, if there's presence of controlled and classified information or CUI, um, but there's other uh, reasons why it would make sense to be level three, four or five. So we're gonna start out this year with applying all the components of the ecosystem um, to about 1500 companies and then whoever else we can fit in on a commercial basis, meaning companies that want to get assessed but don't necessarily have contracts requiring it. Um, but the, the, uh, the priority will be the, um, the 1500 companies. Um, but by 2026, uh, everyone. So they're gonna roll this out uh, over time. So this year they're saying, you know, 1500 companies are the priority. Next year, they're talking about thousands of companies. And then you know, the years after that, hundreds of thousands of companies. So in the DOD, um, in the DIB, in the Defense Industrial Base, there's 265,000 named companies. And um, a lot of them are gonna need to have multiple assessments. So we're estimating about 300,000 by 2026 will uh, we'll have to go through the process of being assessed and that assessment occurs every three years. So you can start to get a sense for the scale of this. And if you think that you know it's a big number, it's because it's the biggest uh, program of its kind in history. And it was developed faster than any program of its kind. And there's many programs like this. I mean, ISO, many different derivatives of ISO, CMMI, ITIL, um, COBIT, many other programs like this that, that focus on organizational uh, maturity of some kind, um, bigger, faster than anything that's ever done and not a penny to the taxpayers, mm -hmm. um, which is really the really cool part of this because this was completely um, volunteer. Uh, now the board is getting staff and eventually there will be funding th uh, through the process of conducting assessments. But at this point in time, US taxpayers have paid nothing for all of the hard work that's been done by this really great group of folks. Um, but this really started, you know, uh, really more, just about two years ago, a little less than two years ago. And you probably know the name Katie Arrington, who's the CISO for the uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. Um, and she was commenting on, you know, for three years, uh, companies were supposed to be self uh, attesting to NIST 800-171 and uh, 
there was a lot of evidence that the companies weren't actually performing at that level. And you even see it today uh, when companies say, well, CMMC is going to be very expensive for us to implement. And I always ask, I say, well, didn't you sign the self-attestation from last year saying you were compliant with, with NIST? And you know, they said, yes, we did. And I said, well, then you're, you know, 90% of the CMMC is overlapped with that. So this shouldn't be that big a deal for you. Um, so hopefully, uh, you know, most of the companies that go through this process um, were in fact um, going through the self-assessment process and, um, and won't have a, a big uh, chasm to, to cross as they adopt CMMC. And I'll talk about, uh, I, I understand we have some questions on funding, so I'll try to answer those if I can. Um, the reason for this is obvious. I mean, solar winds has, has been on the front page of every uh, newspaper. People always ask me, well, would CMMC have stopped solar winds? And it's like, it doesn't really work that way. CMMC is about organizational maturity and you know all of those things put together when everybody gets online, will increase the awareness and the cyber posture of all these companies. And it isn't specifically addressing that problem, but it specifically addresses many other problems. Um, the biggest one, you know, the, the amount of money is, is just unfathomable. I and mean, we talk about defense industry uh, risk and how much money a taxpayer money is being siphoned away by our adversaries, but it isn't just the defense industry. I mean, all of us in our personal lives have had, you know, either breaches or scares of breaches when Netflix or JCPenney or Sears or, you know, Visa or, you know, whatever your credit card or bank account is, uh, you know, members of my family have had their bank accounts stolen and, and messed with. And, you know, it's everywhere. It isn't just, um, it isn't just the Defense Department. And, you know, if anybody thinks the electrical grid is, is safe, uh, they, they really should think about that because, you know, there's all kinds of risks all around us every day with, with uh, cybersecurity. Right here in Florida, we had a, um, a breach where the water was poisoned for a town that they were able to actually change the mixture of chemicals that are put in water to keep it um, safe to drink. They were able to do that from outside the building. And, uh, you know, these kind of things are going on all around us. So, so why, why is something like CMMC necessary? Why do we have to have, you know, why not use ISO 27001 or NIST or some of these other models? And the answer is, A, it's a maturity model, which is a new idea in the cyber world that we, because not everybody's at level five. A lot of companies don't even know how to spell cyber. And so giving them that level one, that basic cyber hygiene um, is uh, gonna change everything. The, the other reason uh, CMMC is so important is, is everybody's talking about it. Like everybody in our industry is talking about CMMC right now. And if I think back three or four years ago, uh, nobody was talking about cyber. And I know, you know, I was a CIO of a company at the time and you know, the CISO, we didn't even have CISOs back then. Um, the, the person whose job it was, was to focus on cyber, you know, that person was not a, a, an executive. He wasn't, he or she wasn't a, a, a member of the executive team. Now they are. So this whole conversation has completely changed. CMMC has a lot to do with it. And um, the other reason why CMMC is really necessary is that um, it gives us all a standard. It's a universal standard. Now, the cool thing about universal standards is that they evolve. So nobody ever said CMMC was perfect today, just like NIST and ISO aren't perfect today. Um, but there's a concerted effort to rapidly uh, rev CMMC. There's already a new version being revved or being worked on for the next release to improve it upon the lessons learned from our pilot programs. Um, so everything about this program is good. Um, it's a massive effort, yeah, but um, the way they're approaching this is, is really, uh, it's a win-win for everybody. Um, the most obvious, um, you know, example of why the DOD wanted to do this was the F-35. So up on the top here, you have the F-35, and on the bottom, you've got Chinese version of the F-30, oh, I'm sorry, on the top, you have the Chinese version, and on the bottom, you have the U.S. version. It's the exact same airplane. And it came out uh, not long after the F-35 had its first flight. And 
the, the, the engineering drawings and uh, the billions of dollars of effort that went into this were stolen by one of our um, adversaries. And um, this is just one example, and it's not even the biggest example. Um, grid issues, uh, the OPM breach, of course, that everybody, you know, anybody that worked for the government had, you know, I had my information breached and had my identity stolen. And, you know, it was a nightmare for people. And it happened to millions of people. Uh, intellectual property being stolen, uh, contract information, uh, personal uh, PII, personal information. So all of these reasons point to we need a evolutionary system that we can move people up at different levels and get everybody moving in the same direction so that eventually we're all performing at level three or above. So... So the CMMI model is evolutionary. It has five levels. It has two major components in it. This slide's a little bit fuzzy. I got a better one coming up. Uh, it's got two, two major components. It has controls, or what they're calling practices, um, that map roughly to practices and controls in NIST and in ISO, just to use the shorthand of those terms. But it also has uh, what they're calling processes, which um, you may be familiar with if you're familiar with ISO 9000 or CMMI. These are standards around how these things are done and written down standards and managed processes that are measured and people are trained in. So it really addresses the people, process, and technology aspect of change. And, and the problem with audit models uh, like ISO 927001 you know, as, as, as well respected as it deserves to be, is that it doesn't really account for the change management part of the people part of the people part, people process and technology. And the CMMC has um, taken a page out of CMMI. It, it looks like that is very similar to that. And they're, you know, they're asking users to not only demonstrate that they have a control in place, but that they've had it in place for some period of time and that they, it is likely they will continue to have it in, in their place. Because we've learned lessons from the audit models and that's what I do for a living. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we've learned that audit models, um, people prepare for audits and then they uh, stop the preparation as soon as the audit is over. And um, the CMMC has a maturity requirement. It basically says, um, you know, you will, this is how you do business. This is the way you normally work. And that's what we're trying to validate. And then what's the likelihood and the risk that the minute the assessment is over that we won't do that anymore. So that is built into this model. And you can see from this table, there are five maturity levels. So maturity level one is called performed. That means people just do the basics and there really isn't any process around it or training or not much documentation or description or policies or anything like that. Uh, maturity level two adds a bunch of controls, but it also adds a requirement that all the processes are documented, meaning there's standard operating procedures and policies and things like that. Training, so people understand how to use them. Uh, maturity level three is called manage. That's, that's about putting plans together and managing you know, your operation in a cohesive and transparent way using data and plans and policies and procedures and all those things together. Um, maturity level four introduces the idea of collecting and reviewing data so that you can recommend changes and improvements. And maturity level five uh, implies a continual loop of continuous, what, what we call relentless improvement in the agile world um, is built into maturity level five. So this is that evolutionary um, step. Now, each one of these levels also has within it, um, let me see, I guess I don't have that slide, uh, which has a number of controls. So like ML1 has 17 controls and ML2 adds another, I think 25 or 30 and ML3 adds another 70 or so. Not the exact numbers are not quite that, but they're close to that. And as you move up to the levels, the, the practices in level one and level two get promoted. 
So while you've got these 17 level one practices that don't require you to have them documented or managed or measured or trained or anything like that, once you're doing an ML3 assessment, all of those ML1 um, practices go from performed to documented to managed. So the maturity level component of the practices actually increases and becomes more rigorous as you move up, uh, even though there's different practices at each level. So it's important to know that an ML1 assessment um, doesn't require demonstration of maturity, but a level three assessment does, including for the ML1 controls and practices. So it's it's a multi-dimensional model um, that really takes into consideration this notion of, of an evolutionary improvement of the ecosystem. So all of this sounds really good. Um, great idea. They, they're fabulous thinking that went on at the DOD and our friends at the SEI, Software Engineering Institute, um, who also authored CMMI, by the way. And uh, um, let's see, Hopkins, APL, and MITRE were all in the DOD, of course, uh, led by um, Katie and Stacey Bostjanik. Um, they did a fabulous job putting the model together, but then it had to be commercialized. So it's a little bit like um, you know a think tank that said, oh, here's all this great stuff. Now we need to operationalize it. So let's spin it out. And that's exactly what they did. And the way they did this is they spun out, well, they didn't spin out, but they called for the creation in, from industry of an accreditation body, an independent um, nonprofit organization or soon to be nonprofit actually, um, whose role it is to commercialize this essentially. Um, communicate and clarify the standard, put together testing and accreditation requirements, license training organizations and putting curriculum together, licensing trainers, licensing C3PAOs, the assessment organizations, authorizing assessors and training them and doing quality and putting together uh, codes of professional conduct and license agreements and online systems for, app for applying and all of the things that are involved in putting together this ecosystem, that role is being performed by the accreditation body under contract, uh, which is a no cost contract uh, with the DOD, meaning there's zero taxpayer funding of this um, from the DOD. Um, now there, there's going to be funding in the form of, of assessment fees, but, and you know, somebody will always say, well, that ends up getting paid for by, by the taxpayers. Of course it does, yeah. Of course, that's how it works. That's how everything works. But um, the creation of this model and this ecosystem was completely uh, free to the taxpayers. There were no fees charged to the DOD for this at all. Um, and, and frankly, this was, this was lots of work. <laughs> so uh, there's an ecosystem out there. If you go to cmmcab.org, you'll see um, lots of stuff out there about what's been going on and where we are and and you know what's been deployed and what's coming and so it's, it's really a great great site you can also apply to be if you wanted to be an assessor or something like that you can always do that um it's a non-stock corporation it's actually uh uh not a non-profit yet although that application has been filed with the irs and that takes months to get back so uh we expect we'll hear back from them in the next few months um, it's made up of um, a very diverse set of, uh, pra of professionals. So not everybody on the board is a cyber professional. Some people have said, you know, why are there people on the board that aren't, aren't cyber professionals? And that's because we have people on the board that are training professionals and people on the board that are uh, assessment professionals and people on the board that are legal professionals or contracts people. So we had a very diverse board, including some of the greatest cyber, you know, cybersecurity minds in the country. Um, and we also have a very diverse uh, business background. We have uh, military folks, you know, people recently out of the military. Uh, we have uh, people from Accenture. We have people from uh, large defense contractors. We have small business owners. Um, so we've got a really healthy mix of um of people from all you know walks of the industry, and if people have uh, exhibited a lot of concern about this. They've said, "Hey, the small businesses aren't aren't represented. I'm worried about it. I run a small business, or you know, the big companies are saying, how come there's no really big companies?'" Well, 
The answer is, is those things are all in there. And amazingly, you know, it was amazing to me because um, I run a small business uh, that the, the folks from the big defense contractors treated me like an equal. So I, I never felt like being a small business was had anything negative on the board. Everybody on the board has a job and everybody's respected. A very diverse group. Um, these people serve as individuals, not as representatives of their parent organizations. You've probably noted that my company name wasn't used in the introduction. We don't do that on the AV. We're, 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 we don't do it on purpose. Anyway, sometimes, sometimes facilitators let it slip in or sometimes things get revealed. But for the most part, we're here as individuals who are patriotic and trying to help protect the nation along with everybody else. Um, board members cannot be assessors. They cannot run a C3 PAO. Um, they can't benefit from any of the regulatory things. So the, the idea that, you know, a board member would start a C-3PO and we would approve them and give them contracts and stuff, that's just not allowed. Um, you know, board members, many of the board members are consultants or had run consulting firms and they will be able to continue to do that, obviously, but not in the regulated environment where the AB gets to make a decision. Um, but the, at the same time, there is a strict ethics, ethics and conflict of interest policy that we're very serious about. Um, but in the end, our goal and our mission, or, well, our goal is to build a world-class ecosystem that can support 300,000 companies in five years. And our mission is to operation, operationalize the training and the accreditation and the certification so it's smoothly operating. Um, it is not smoothly operating right now. Uh, we're just getting it rolled out. So a lot of people have said, hey, I'm having trouble getting into this system or that system. And yes, I'm sorry about that. We're, we're getting everything together as quickly as we can. Um, there's a lot of stuff on this slide, but I wanted to, I wanted to and I'm going to go through some of these roles before I'm done, um, before I get done in a few minutes. But there's many, many roles. And uh, some people have asked me, you know, why are there why are there so many roles? You've made it too complicated. And I say, well, three hundred thousand is a big number. Um, and if you add in some of the other agencies that are talking about it, we could be up to a million pretty quickly. You know, within a couple of years, um, you can't do that on a shoestring. You need a big. You need an infrastructure. You need different roles. So we've got identified uh, roles, multiple types of assessor roles, multiple types of instructor roles. Uh, multiple types of organizations to manage those um, those roles. Uh, we've got also got uh, some people that do consulting and want to be part of the ecosystem because, you know, when we were rolling this out, people who didn't want to be assessors, people that didn't want to be instructors, but wanted to be working closely with us on CMMC said, well, where's, you know, where's a role for me? I want to have a role. I want to be part of this. So that's how we came up with the registered practitioners and the and the registered provider organizations. And then we decided that we were gonna outsource or license really the training and have third parties, universities and other third parties do the training. So that's where the least licensed training providers, the licensed publishing partners, those are the people creating training materials. We're using Scantron to create the exams. So the AB has reached out to, to world-class organizations all over the country. Uh, and we're partnering with under license with that or they're under license with us to deliver these services and that that's how we're going to scale the 300,000 is, is by distributing this across the nation and eventually across the world so let me just finish with with a couple a couple of you of what you'll see in the market um, as this rolls out um, so let's see here There's a number of certified individuals who um, who will serve the market, starting uh, with the certified professional, who is the um, kind of the entry level, the person that wants to get involved. Whoops, sort of lost that for a second there. Um, the certified professional is someone who really wants to get into the CMC ecosystem, probably wants to be an assessor or instructor, and this provides them with the basic instruction, examination, training, and experience they need to start doing that. Um, 
being an assessor would be next. And there's multiple levels of assessors. There's level one assessors, level three and level five, based on which level of the CMMC you want to spend your time working in. Uh, many assessors will just do level one because uh, 60 percent of the 300,000 are level one. Uh, certified instructor, uh, we're requiring all instructors to be also be assessors. Uh, the only training the accreditation body will do is the certified master instructor. And that's the individuals that will be teaching the teachers. So we have to have some way of, of doing that. And then we have a quality auditor role. So those are the, those are the people that get certified. Um, but in the meantime, we've, um, while we were building all this, the DOD came to us and said, can you, uh, can you get assessors in the field more quickly? And we, our response to that was to create the provisional assessor program, which we, right now we have 102 provisional assessors in the market. And we're gonna assess, we're gonna add another 50 provisional assessors um, in the next couple of weeks. And these are the folks that are gonna do the pilots for the assessments. Uh, and there's a temporary role. We also have this notion of registered professionals. These are the people who wanted to be consultants in the field, be part of the ecosystem, maybe not being um, certified. Maybe they just want to focus on helping companies improve, never want to do assessments, never want to do training, but they want to be in our marketplace and they want some training. So we created the registered practitioner role. And right now we have about 1200 of these registered, trained and tested, ready to go. Um, and if you go to our uh, website, you'll see it on the marketplace that there's a bunch, I don't know how many are on there yet, but there's 1200 applicants. And I know we've approved about half of them so far. Um, now, just a quick note, um, anybody that's qualified is welcome to be a consultant in this space. This, the, there's no requirement to be an RP to be a, um, a consultant in CM, you know, CMMC and cyber. There's lots of super talented professionals out there doing consulting. Um, but the, uh, the registered practitioners have those skills, but also have some CMMC training specific to the AB and they've taken a test uh, and passed it. <laughs> uh, they've also had a background check done on them, a criminal background check. So it's just kind of an added level of, of, um, security and, and peace of mind for companies that might be hiring professionals. You know, if they don't know somebody, how do they sort of filter through, um, they're welcome to hire anybody they'd like, anyone they think is a fit, uh, but the registered practitioner uh, gives that little bit of added level of, of um, security for them. Um, we also have licensed organizations. Uh, the most well-known one is the CMMC Third Party Assessment Organization or the C3PAO. These are the companies that will sell, market, contract, and manage the assessment process. Um, and again, distribution, the AB could do this. We could have built it with 500 employees to manage all this, but we didn't. We built it for 15 or 20 employees so that we can have 500 C3PAOs around the world who have assessors working for them. We also have this licensed training provider. There'll be, there'll be many of those. These are the folks that'll be conducting the training around the world not the AB. We, again, we could have staffed up 100 instructors and done that, but we decided to, to distribute it. And we have something called the Licensed Partner Publisher. And this is the organization that develops training materials. And we are distributing that as well because we want different training options to be available to people. One set of training objectives and guidelines that, that we provide uh, and the DOD also works on with us and then an unlimited set of partners to develop training, whether it be PowerPoint slides, online self-training, virtual reality training using an Oculus Quest to, you know, something like that would be awesome. Um, video training, virtual training, whatever suits your learning need, a uh, licensed published publishing partner will provide that. Again, distributed. We didn't want to be in the business of developing training materials. Now there's one more that's not on here. It's brand new and, and I'm spearheading this at the AB. It's the licensed software provider, the LSP. And these are companies that have tools that they think are good tools for the CMMC ecosystem and want to be 
associated with the AB um, and, what, and are willing to go through an examination of their tool for various attributes to ensure that the quality is there and the security is there and it, it provides all the feature functionality as advertised. And the AB will be releasing a program to, to, to register licensed software providers in the future. So that's another thing that's coming out. And then finally, we have the AB registered organization. Now, this is a consulting firm. So think like Deloitte and Touche or, you know, like, uh, you know, Systems Consulting Inc. in Fairfax, Virginia or wherever um, companies that, that want to sell market, deliver consulting solutions in the CMC market. And again, want to have that added level of um, background checks, uh, examination, um, signing code of professional conduct, being on our marketplace and the things, and the, the other things. And we're just like the RPs. And we're not, again, the AB is not trying to corner the consulting market here. We're saying, if you want your company to go through that examination and you do well and you sign up um, and you sign the code of professional conduct and willing to live within the guidelines that the AB um, lays out things like conflict of interest and, and those sorts of things. Um, if you're willing to do that, come on, come on down, sign up with the AV because um, a lot of people are asking us for recommendations. So that's what the RPO is about. All right, so with that, I am done. I don't, I don't know if I took a half an hour or not, Jackie, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, Say it, it, I'm it ready was, you were to take on the questions money. if people have them. <laughs> you did, yeah. You were you were pretty close there. That was really that was. I was quite impressed. Um, I've done this do, a few hundred times this year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we do have a few questions that have come on. Uh, the first question is uh, in regards to: uh, Is there or will there be a concept of continuous compliance under CMMC? Well, they are talking about that. So we're not, we're not really there yet. Uh, there's been numerous uh, proposals made for that. Now there is a, there is a reassessment requirement um, for um, a three year validity period. So assessors have to, assessments have to be done every three years. And there is various um, reciprocity agreements being formulated that involve other models that, that could fill in some of that gap, but there is going to be that three-year um, renewal. There have been a number of proposals for continuous monitoring and for um, surveillance assessments, and we're still talking through some of those issues. Okay, and then there's also a follow-up to that. Um, also for FedRAMP or DOD, IL-4 approved CSPs, will there be reciprocity of those accreditations to CMMC? Yeah. So we're waiting on official word on that. So the DOD has announced that there will be uh, some level of reciprocity for um, DIP, DCMA DIPCAC assessments, um, FedRAMP and ISO 27001. They haven't announced exactly what that looks like, but I think we can assume that it will be a practice by practice analysis of those models uh, to the CMMC and where um, sameness exists and validated reciprocity could be granted for those practices. <coughs> but the uh, DOD um, owns that process and they have a working group working on it and they say they're going to announce pretty soon what the details are. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, this is from Neil. Has there been any congressional support for CMMC? Um, and if so, who do you know? <laughs> yeah, who do I know? Yeah, you know, it's really funny because I, I um, in my business dealings in the last 20 years, I mostly focused on commercial sector. So I didn't have a lot of, I couldn't really say that I had a lot of governmental experience, especially direct with Congress or with the DOD. And that's one of the reasons I joined the board is I wanted to, to, I get that experience and have that experience of working with those those good folks. And one of the things I've learned is is not to name names, <laughs> but um, I can tell you that uh, we uh, there is definitely congressional interest. There are, are always inquiries um, from various 
entities within Congress um, that I've personally answered and have been involved with, and so have other board members. Um, so there's definitely interest by the Congress and uh, especially some of the committees. So I can say yes, but I think I'll I'll probably demur on the name, the, the naming of names. <laughs> We have another question here in regards to uh you might have been on mute jack yeah, oh sorry hear. can you hear me now can you guys hear me now is that okay we can we Great. can hear you now yeah question in regards to uh recertification and renewal is it is it the same for all levels and that's yeah all for yes three so you, if you're talking about level one through five right if you're level one your level one will be valid for three years. Now, there's some chance that you may want to bid on a contract or may get a contract requirement to be level three, somewhere in the middle of that uh, validity period, in which case you'd have to conduct a level three assessment to bid on the contract because you're only level one. Um, but yeah, it's the same for all. It's three years for each level right now. That's the plan. Okay, we have another one in regards to, have there been any discussions with insurance companies for CMMC to become a requirement for cyber liability coverage? Discussions, read that question again. I'm not sure what, sure. I, I, it sounded like a statement. So I'm wondering if, is it, what's the question exactly? <laughs> have there been any discussions with insurance Maybe companies you'd... for CMMC to become a requirement for cyber liability coverage? Uh, we have not, we, the DAB has not engaged with any insurance companies on that particular topic. We, we have engaged with insurance companies on other topics, but not on that one specifically. It's a good question though. I'm going to write that one down <laughs> and I go ask about that. We have another question here. Uh, are you accepting more assessors into the provisional program? Um, you kind of broke up in the beginning of that. So say that one more time. Oh, sure. Are you accepting more assessors into the provisional program? Uh, um, well, so let me just tell that story real quick and then I'll, I'll answer um, the question. So we had about 12 or 1300 certified assessor applicants. Um, and of course, nobody's a certified assessor yet because the classes don't exist. And we only have the provisional program. So out of those 1200, we randomly selected the 100. Well, first it was 75 and then it went to 100. We randomly selected 100 folks. So we didn't really have applications for the provisional. We just said the DOD would like us to put 100 assessors in the field as fast as possible. What's the best way to do that? And the best way to do that is to randomly select them. So we did that. And now they've asked us to do another one. And my, my understanding is that we're going to be randomly selecting them also. So we're not technically taking applications for more provisionals, but we are picking um, more provisionals. Um, I, I guess I should check on exactly how that process is going to work because we have staff now, so it's not me that's doing it. I can tell you how I did it. Or my team did it in the beginning, but they're doing it differently now. But I do know they're picking and those are coming from the existing pool of um, assessor applicants. So that they aren't new, they're, they're not new applicants, they're existing applicants. Okay, we have another question here in regards to uh, studying for certifications and prices for exams, just materials. I know you had referenced some of that information before, uh, just generally where all of this information can be found. Yeah, the um, the pricing for the training and the exam has has not been published yet, as far as I know. Um, and I think we're going to see different um, different prices for training classes based on the provider and the um, the experience. On, on the testing, I, there actually is a number, but I don't I don't know what that is off the top of my head that has been published. But I believe that. Um, it is not published right now. So, and the story behind that is, and when we first opened our doors, we sold 
um, or we let people purchase advanced vouchers for the exams and, and many people did. And then we decided that it was a, um, a, a big complexity for us to track all of that because it's, it's what they call unearned income. We don't, um, it, it's money we just have to hold for years. So it just got to be like, like kind of silly. So we said, um, let's not do that anymore. So I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, we have another question that came in. Uh, will this information, will this presentation be shared or available for further viewing? Yes, this uh, this is being recorded. This will be available. All of you who are attending, you will be contacted afterwards uh, with a link to the recording so that you can share it with your teams as well. And we have another one here uh, in regards to time frames. What are the time frames for compliance with CMMC, and will any of those change due to COVID? When you say times, is the question about um, like when assessments are going to start, or is it about duration of assessments? You know, it looks uh, time frames for compliance. So I'm assuming that, uh, you know, those that need to be compliant within for CMMC, will any of those time frames change due to COVID? That's my, uh, that is my interpretation well, of the question. The, so this, this could, there could be a couple of answers here. So the, the, the roadmap for when companies need to be compliant with CMMC is has been laid out in the interim rule by the DOD. So they're saying in 2021, if you're part of this pilot, you know, 10 or 15 pilot programs that your deadline is prior to uh, award. Um, so it's anybody's guess exactly what that timeline is, but they're saying the DOD is saying like midsummer or something like that. Um, yeah, uh, COVID has thrown everybody for a loop. So I guess that makes everything a little unpredictable. There's a lot of discussions going on about, you know, are there practices in the CMMC that you actually need to be on site for? And of course, many small businesses, especially, are still um, have no on site workers. You know, I haven't been to my office in, you know, over a year. Um, so it's possible, I suppose. But the other side of that that's really interesting is um, the amount of work that went into standing up this ecosystem wouldn't have been possible if we weren't all working from home. Um, and if, you know, if the businesses weren't in the state that they were in. So that's a good thing. So I, I, I think between those two things, we probably won't see much delay. Uh, but, you know, COVID is, uh, COVID's a very unpredictable beast. So it's hard to say uh, what's going to happen with that, but I don't think so. Okay. We have a question here about the most common maturity level. What do you think will be the most common maturity level at this point? Since I'm it not hearing you if you're talking, Jackie. Well, I must be having a problem with my mic. Can you guys hear me now? Hmm. Are you guys able to hear me now? I can hear you, Jackie. Okay, excellent. Um, the Let's question was in see. regards to, oh, can you maybe hear me? it's me that can't hear. It, yeah, oh, it might well, be you, Jeff. Well, maybe it's me Jeff. that can't hear you. I'm sorry about that. Let me just <laughs> check something here. I seem to be working fine. I don't know. Yeah, I've got a few people commenting that they can hear us, that they can hear me. I hear you now. I hear you now. I don't know what, what it could have been my AirPods. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, another question that we had, uh, what do you think will be the most common maturity level at this point, since it isn't in, in many contracts yet, uh, what should companies focus on right now? Level one or level three, really what should yeah. they be target maturity? Level? I've, I've had um, that question a lot and um, it comes down. So it, it comes down to two factors. One do you manage controlled unclassified information as part of your dealings with the DOD? If you do, level three is going to be a must have for you. You, you have to go to level three. Um, even if you've only got an enclave or some small part of your company that, you know, segregated um, around that data in those networks, it'll have to be level three. Now, the, the second thing driving maturity level is, is business goals. I've had 
especially small business owners come to me and say, you know, we want to be level three. And I say, do you manage CUI? And they say, no. I said, well, you don't really have to be. They're like, no, but we want to be. <laughs> we want to be the best, you know, have the best we can have. So the, the DOD is saying that 60% of the companies in the DIB will need to be level one. Mm -hmm. And that right now, 30% of the companies will need to be level three. And they've, they've kind of, they're not really talking a lot about level four and five yet, but we can assume that, you know, five to 10% of companies probably will be in that window. Um, so it really depends on those two factors. Does the, do you handle CUI and do you have business goals that drive you to be level three, even when you don't need to be? So we expect um, at least half the assessments to be level one. Um, and especially early on. So um, my advice would be, you know, definitely plan on doing level one if you don't have CUI. And, and I would love it if people would do level one first instead of trying to go to level three just because of the complexity and the, the added burden and cost of the process maturity piece and all of those things make level one very attractive. So I, I like level one a lot and I wish more companies would do it um, unless they have CUI, in which case they can't. We have another question that came in here. Are there any tax incentives or other programs to encourage companies to make the investment in CMMC sooner than later? Yeah, I'm not aware of any tax incentive programs. There, there's, I've been in meetings where people have talked about the idea of incentive programs and there's people meeting about it, but right now I'm not aware of any particular program like that. Okay. And we do have another question that came in, uh, what we were talking about earlier, uh, if back to reciprocity, if reciprocity will be granted for IL-4, what level CMMC will equate to IL-4 accredited CSPs? And it's just kind of a guess. <laughs> yeah, guess you know what? Fine. I don't, it's more, the, the problem with the reciprocity question is it's complicated. It's not it's not as simple as saying, you know, we're IL-4, so what level are we? Because there's 100 and, you know what, 130 practices plus 130 plus practices in CMMC. You know, IL-4, ISO 27001, DIBCAC, DCMA, uh, they, you know, NIST 8171, whatever the, whatever the, the model is, some of that will have reciprocity and some of them won't in, in terms of if you look at it practice by practice. So it's a very tedious task. The, um, the DOD has to go through every one of these one line at a time and saying, okay, you know, 1.1 over here is equal to 2.7 over here. And in order to determine the, it, its equalness, they have to dig into the source material and the examples and the, the things that that you know make that practice live before they can say these two things are equivalent. So I, I, I'm, I'd be reluctant to say you know it's equal to this. Um, there are elements of IL-4 that are equal to CMMC level three, um, but it's more complicated than that. Okay. We also have uh, another one. This one came via email. Uh, this one is, um, our organization has adopted a prioritized security strategy around CIS and the 20 controls. Is there any overlap and synergy between CMMC, AB, and CIS? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's always synergy between the, any of these models. So I'm not a really a CIS expert, but there's synergy in that, um, these models all have a people process and technology component to them, right? And getting your act together with people process and technology is actually pretty complicated to do it well. Um, if it were complicated, you know, we wouldn't be talking about it for 30 years, right? And so if you can master one of them, that gives you a, you know, a real leg up on any of the others. So, so the answer is yes, there is synergy because they both require 
you know, people, process, and technology implementation that's aligned and that meets requirements. And that right there is, is you know, the first time you go through a program like that, regardless of model, it can be tedious and difficult. Um, doesn't have to be, but it can be. And, but once you know how to do it, the other models are easier, right? So there's synergy from that perspective. I, I don't know, I haven't done an analysis like a reciprocity analysis. So I don't know from that perspective what the answer is. Okay. Next question. Uh, are, we are we still responsible for ensuring that our subcontractors and suppliers can receive and protect CUI? Well, I, so I don't, I, there's legal implications there. So I don't want to comment on that specifically and, you know, what the legal uh, responsibility is, but, but ultimately the entire supply chain needs to protect CUI. So your suppliers are going, if they have access to the CUI, you know, you give them or share with them, they will themselves need to be level three and they themselves will need to comply. Um, so you know, to the extent that you're a prime or, or a big sub that has lots of other subs, I would say that, yeah, you have, um, it would be in your best interest to take responsibility of, of that. Um, but there are legal implications that I don't really, I'm not qualified to answer there. Okay. And here's another, another one that just came through, uh, based on the 300,000 DIB vendors that you described earlier, will there be enough assessors? Will there be a backlog in getting assessed or audited? Well, I mean, the, we, um, so I talked about, about diversification, uh, and, and, um, of, of the ecosystem. So I think that if we had tried to sort of hoard the whole thing at the AB level and manage all the instructors and manage all of the assessors, we probably would have a backlog. But I think the strategy to, um, to spread this work out among many different entities will in fact give us the, the bandwidth we need. And we think we need about um, 300, or I'm sorry, about 3000 assessors by 2026. Um, so just, just doing like some simple math, cause we still don't really know the exact numbers. We'll need about a um, hundred licensed training providers. And I think we already have more than 20 online. So, you know, and an assessor, if, if it's 60% level three assessors can do, you know, end assessments a year. So I think the numbers work out, um, but remember that, you know, nobody's ever done this and we haven't done it yet either, but our plan to diversify this, I think is, is the hedge against that problem. And that's the reason we did it. Um, so we are gonna watch it closely. Okay. Uh, looks like the last one here is in regards to technologies or solutions. Will the CMMC AB help identify solutions and technologies to help organizations yeah. achieve certification? Yeah, uh, we're not going to take a position on um, tools or uh, vendors of any kind. And we're not going to take a position on consulting firms or anything like that. We're going to remain neutral on all of those issues. However, um, like I said earlier, um, we are launching this licensed software provider program, which is a tool specific program for companies that want to be close to the AB, that want to have access to APIs and, and, and things that, that are published by us to help the DIB companies use CMMC. That doesn't mean that a, a great tool company, you know, can't exist without being part of the ecosystem. They absolutely can. And we're not going to take any, uh, you know, any position about which tool vendors you should, you should use. And we're certainly not going to go into that business. Uh, but we are going to have tool vendors that would like to be part of the ecosystem and have access to, to specifications and things like that, that help them interface a little bit better with the AB. We are going to have that program in place, assuming they're willing to be examined and go through a, an assessment process themselves to make sure that you know their software is secure and meets requirements and all those things. They think like UL Labs for for cyber CMMC software. 
Okay. We had one more come in <laughs> just as you were speaking. It never ends. Yeah. I know. Well, you know, we tried to say that we would, no question would be left unanswered, right? That was okay. our goal was okay. to try to do this. So um, if a CSP is waiting on reciprocity decisions, would he recommend as a CSP, we should take under, we should undertake CMMC accreditation anyway? Yeah. Yes, I, I would say so. I would say that um, absent Absent another solution, you're going to need a CSP is going to need to demonstrate compliance with CMMC, whether that's through reciprocity or through an actual assessment of their organization. So that when an assessor, um, we call these inherited practices in the in the assessment method, or what we're calling the assessment process, I guess now. Um, so if a company is uh, CMMC level three, let's say it's, uh, you know, Amazon AWS or box.com government or something like that. Um, they need to demonstrate their compliance with CMMC. Now that could be either through conducting a CMMC assessment or applying reciprocity, assuming the DOD agrees with their reciprocity model that those, the things that they're offering the company are in fact um, you know, reciprocal, I guess. So it's, it's a little bit complicated right now until reciprocity comes out. But the bottom line really is, is that the CSP has to be in compliance in some way. Okay. Well, it does not appear that to, to, to be that we have any more questions. Um, we uh -huh. had a lot a Last lot of information, yeah. <laughs> lots of information yeah. was shared. Um, we want to let everybody know that should you have any additional questions, please feel free to let us know. I really want to thank you, Jeff, for your time. Uh, you know, you gave Our such pleasure. great information. Yeah. And um, for all of you asking, yeah. yes, you will have access to this after uh, the completion of the discussion today. We, you, it will be sent to you via, via email. And I do also just want to uh, share some additional information. You know, we do have part two. Uh, this is a webinar, this is a CMC webinar series. So we do have part two coming up next month in March. And uh, for anybody who had specific questions, we're gonna really focus on, you know, on ramping to align and achieve CMMC compliance, um, you know, with CIS, uh, with Tony Sager of CIS. So that we're looking forward to that as well. If there's any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. My contact information is there. Uh, Mark Allers, Vice President of Business Development is also there. Please reach out and let us know. And, and uh, thank you for joining with us today. And, and we really appreciate everyone's time.